Well, uh, in the <clears throat> in the interest of time, I think I'm going to get started uh, at the very least with just uh, introducing myself and kind of uh, some of the basics of what we're here for today. Um, my my name is Jeremy Snyder. Uh, I had the privilege of kind of taking the lead on this project, uh, helping encapsulate some of the really interesting uh, research that Berkeley Lab is doing uh, here in the Colorado Rockies uh, on river science. And uh, Berkeley Lab is a Department of Energy National Laboratory, uh, which is kind of a public research institution. It's one of the biggest uh, in the country. And since 1931, uh, they've been uh, hand tackling team side or sorry tackling public uh, research interests uh, and uh, you know have been awarded seven, 16 Nobel prizes and have been responsible for 16 of the elements on the periodic table. Uh, it's one of the biggest research organizations in the country and uh, they do some really cool work one sliver of which we'll be discussing here on this story map. Um, and I'm here today with a couple of other folks, uh, two of whom are on the K-12 education and outreach team who kind of sponsored and uh, promoted this story map. So uh, I'm going to have them introduce themselves, starting with Faith. Hi, Jeremy. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Faith Dukes, and I'm director of K-12 programs here at Berkeley Lab. Hi, everyone. My name is Elisa Vitale, and I am the content instruction coordinator for K-12 programs here at Berkeley Lab. Amazing. And uh, we'll hear a little more about specifically what K-12 programs do uh, and how they play a really awesome role in getting folks <clears throat> to have the opportunity to work uh, at Berkeley Lab and get into STEM fields. Um, but in the meantime, I'm also going to introduce two of the members of the uh, scientific organizations whose work is actually profiled here uh, in the story map. Uh, and I'll start with Ken Williams. Hi, everyone. I'm Ken Williams, and I'm a geoscientist at Berkeley Lab. Uh, I actually was responsible for taking some of the first samples that we'll be hearing about today in the East River watershed uh, back in May of 2014. It's been a remarkable journey between there uh, at that point in time and where we are today. Awesome. And Andrew? Oh. Oh. Sorry, I, uh, you have to enable my, my video. But hi, everyone. Andrew Weedla. I'm a network <laughs> engineer with uh, ESNet, which is the Energy Sciences Network. And uh, uh, we, are, um, we are very lucky to have great scientists who we can collaborate with, like Ken. Amazing. So this uh, this story map is essentially a uh, a look into, like I said, one small sliver of Berkeley Labs research. And as a public institution, most of Berkeley Labs research addresses large scale societal needs of some kind. Uh, and so to understand why the, what this work is and why it's so important, it makes sense to start with what that need is. And at the core of it, of the need for this work is the Colorado River. Uh, and and the Colorado River is, is a fairly, you know, household name at this point, um, <clears throat> and that's because it is one of the most extensively used and fought over rivers in the world. Its water supports 40 million people across the western United States, which pans out to uh, more than one in every 10 Americans. <clears throat> And because it has so many mouths to feed and such an important role in really half of the country by area, uh, it's really essential to understand and be able to manage how much water is in the river. Um, and especially in the face of kind of increasing aridification of the Western United States, ongoing drought and the future of climate change. So Berkeley Lab has been working on doing that for a long time, and that is really at the core of what this research that we're going to be hearing about today is. So in a map view, uh, you can see this is the course that the Colorado River takes from the uh, Colorado Rockies all the way down to the Sea of Cortez in Mexico. And you can see in this satellite image that it really dominates this uh, kind of western half of the United States, which is by far the browner half. Uh, it is very, you know, it's defined by its aridity, by its desert climates. Uh, it is a very dry, you know, kind of uh, arid area. Uh, and as a result, the Colorado River really represents kind of an artery or a lifeline uh, to a lot of the people and industries in this area. So uh, I'm going to take a second here to ask uh, if people can just 
add to the chat, whether they have heard, whether it's in the news or you know, through books, whatever you, whatever about the kind of ongoing drought, uh, increasing drought on the Colorado River, and whether that has affected you in any way that you're aware of. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the the uh, the the headlines that most people will have seen are, you know around Lake Powell, Lake Mead, the the kind of, you know, the, the famous bathtub ring uh, of the reservoirs that are getting lower and lower. It's, it's kind of this pervasive problem, but uh, the impacts on, you know, people's everyday lives who don't live on Lake Mead are not always obvious. Um, but in spite of that, the pretty much everybody in the Western United States is impacted by the Colorado, Colorado River in some way, whether that's uh, because they use electricity that's generated by these massive dams along its length, like the Glen Canyon Dam and the Hoover Dam, whether it's because they eat beef that was ranched on its shores uh, in Colorado, or even if they drink its water, even if they're hundreds and hundreds of miles away from it because its water gets piped uh, across the country in aqueducts like the Central Arizona Project, or if it's just because they eat lettuce in the winter, which the vast, vast majority of which is grown in California's imperial uh, Imperial Valley, which is irrigated with Colorado River water. Um, so whether or not you know it, the Colorado River probably plays a role in your life. And uh, to to study it and to understand you know, how much water is going to be in the river each year, scientists need to look to its source in the Colorado Rockies. Uh, and that's because this is this is the area that the Colorado River drains. It's its watershed or basin. So any water that falls in this area highlighted in blue will eventually flow down the hill and end up in the Colorado. And you can see already in the satellite view that that is, you know, it's a pretty dry area. But in this precipitation map where orange and yellow represents low, very low annual precipitation and blue and green represents high precipitation, you can see that really the only areas in that watershed are here along the spine of the Rockies, which means that 80% of all the water that ends up in the river comes out of these little mountain tributaries. So if you zoom in, the Colorado River Basin as a large watershed is made up of all of these kind of constituent watersheds uh, that basically funnel into small tributaries that eventually can, you know, have a confluence with the river and add their water. Um, these mountain watersheds are what are really important to understand if you are to under, you know, to be able to predict and manage the water that ultimately ends up downstream in the Colorado River itself. And one such mountain watershed is the East River Valley in Crested Butte, Colorado. So this uh, is one of the best studied mountain watersheds in the world, uh, and it has been for, for years and years. And scientists have been using this as kind of a model watershed to understand mountain watersheds everywhere. Um, and at the core of this activity and at the core of the science is really this idea of modeling, which is worth taking a second to, to talk about um, because it's a really core scientific tool. The idea behind scientific models is basically if you can create a really accurate digital representation of a landscape or you know uh, an environment, and you can combine that with just what we know about the laws of physics, you can simulate uh, future scenarios really accurately. And so you can say, you can predict, say, what would happen if you drop you know, a million gallons of snow in one specific part of a watershed, how that's going to flow downstream, how that's going to end up in the water, how it's going to affect ecosystems and, and livelihoods. Um, and so a large part of the science and, you know, the, really the policymaking of river management is tied up in these models. And we have already pretty good models based on a lot of the work that has already been done in places like the East River watershed. But as the stakes grow higher and as we face an increasingly uncertain future with climate change, it's ever more important to collect more and better data about what is actually happening on the ground so you can you know, really increase the accuracy of those models. So this is the story of how scientists in the East River, including the folks we have on the call today, are making that leap and are entering kind of the next generation of data collection in this essential watershed uh, that is a tributary of the Colorado River. So the solution to this problem of monitoring and understanding mountain watersheds uh, is tied up is you know is really uh, rooted in studying watersheds like the East River, 
And uh, the East River Valley, like I said, is one of the best studied in the world. It's dotted with these sensor stations that are kind of scattered around and collect information about how water moves through the landscape. Uh, this is what they look like. They're you know, really kind of glorified weather stations, uh, but their, ver their purpose is to track water as it moves through the landscape, through space and through time you know, over the course of seasons. Uh, and these are really powerful tools. They can provide a ton of information, but in the past, they've kind of been handicapped by the fact that they're really scattered throughout this rugged mountain landscape. And the, you know, the only way for scientists to interact with them is to you know, drive or hike or you know, snowshoe out to them, collect their data by hand one by one, uh, and hopefully kind of piece that together into this, this overall view. Um, but luckily that is changing. Uh, and the team that is kind of behind that or a subset of the team uh, includes Ken Williams, Kate Robinson, and Andrew Widely, uh, two of whom are here today. So uh, with that, I'll pass it off to Ken Williams, uh, who you met earlier, uh, to, to hear about what he does uh, in this big project. Super. Thanks, Jeremy. So again, I'm Ken Williams. I'm a geologist by training. I'm actually talking to you tonight from Colorado. Uh, where I oversee all of the field research activities at the watershed that Jeremy's been describing. And so I think it's important actually to highlight one really distinct aspect of what we're doing. At the end of the day, if you want to understand how, when, and where snowfall changes in climate change that impact snowfall, impact water flows, you have to pick an experimental catchment. And so we've settled on the East River uh, in the area of central Colorado near the town of Crested Butte because it's actually very representative of other watersheds within the state of California, throughout much of the Rocky Mountains. And it's emblematic of kind of the future changes that are likely to impact snow accumulation and water exports. And so we're not really overemphasizing the importance of our specific study watershed, other than to really emphasize that it's a representative watershed. It's a place where we can really make investments from data gathering, uh, numerical modeling that Jeremy touched on, and now this really important uh, testbed demonstration of how to actually get the data from where the measurements are made to where we're located so we can actually begin to understand its implications. And so where we're working is really meant to be emblematic of other watersheds like this um, throughout the Colorado Rockies and other mountainous systems, as I say this here in Nevada. Very cool. And can you tell us a little more about what the, I guess, really the, you know, the day to day or, you know, the, the moment to moment activity of collecting data from these stations and from around the East River has been? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Jeremy. So, one, well, there's a couple of things. One, you're, you're looking at a dilapidated version of my Toyota Land Cruiser <laughs> on the left, um, battling outdoor conditions while trying to, uh, to reach your important field study sites can be challenging at the best of times. At the worst of times, it can be absolutely impossible to collect data. On the right is kind of where we've been. That's been the traditional model. And that's a system wherein we have a variety of measurements. For instance, we want to understand kind of what the saturation state of soils beneath a very dense conifer forest um, look like as a function of time. Do they get wetter during certain times of the year? Are they drier during certain times of the year? How do they respond to big events like a giant rainstorm, for instance? Well, we collect that data autonomously. And so there's a network of sensors that are recording measurements, for instance, of, uh, of soil water saturation, but that data isn't necessarily available, available to us in real time. So individuals such as myself uh, and our network of extended um, field-based technicians have to periodically go out and retrieve, manually retrieve this data. It's fine. Yeah. It's the way the world works. But unfortunately <laughs> for us, we would we'd love to get to a point where we have access to that data in real time. Amazing. And with that excellent segue, I will get to the next member of the team, Andrew. Uh, to talk a little more about what he does. Yeah, so a uh, uh, little background. Uh, so I'm with something called ESNet. We're the Energy Sciences Network, and we are the high-speed fiber optic network, and there's a map of it behind me that you can perhaps see. Uh, we connect all of the DOE laboratories and uh, uh, user facilities around the complex, and then we collect to sort of uh, uh, 
colleagues in research networks all over the world. So we move, our job really is to move data collected um, at, uh, as part of experiments, um, things like high energy physics, cosmology, all kinds of things. Um, and traditionally, we've been very focused on fixed site uh, kinds of things where you have data being produced at a large scientific facility that has to be moved. But increasingly, as we all know, things like uh, wireless and Internet of Things are letting field scientists like Ken uh, deploy all kinds of instruments out into the world to measure what's happening, climate change and earth and environmental stuff um, in ways that we never could do before. So this is very much a new business for us to get into to figure out how do we pull that fiber optic network we have out to places uh, where we can't use fiber, but we have to use wireless instead to move the data um, back to the U.S. National Laboratories and Supercomputer Centers that we use to do the numeric modeling and simulation that Ken spoke of. So um, very, cool. very much this is an opportunity for us to collaborate. Uh, so Ken has, and then the folks working sort of at the uh, at the the, the watershed uh, field uh, site have sensors deployed sort of throughout the environment collecting all kinds of different uh, things, weather conditions, hydrology, atmospheric impacts, solar radiation, all kinds of things. And so uh, really it's a lesson in trying to figure out, okay, how do we then build the capabilities to make it possible so that he doesn't have to rely and his 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 folks who work with him don't have to rely on Land Rovers and hiking to pick up SD cards from sensors out in the field, but we can instead Very knit cool. these together into a real-time network. Uh, so that's bit what we're trying to do. And uh, this is a, a, a really exciting time technology from a technical standpoint, from a technology standpoint, to be able to do this because there's new options that let us communicate out into the world in ways that we were never able to before. Cool. So and I'll time. pass it off to Ken to talk a little more about how that actually works here yeah. in the field. Um, so this is what the, one of these sensor stations looks like kind of in a diagram view. Ken, can you tell us a little more about what we're looking at here? Absolutely, Jeremy, I know there's some sort of iterative scrolling that you can do while I'm talking, but at the end of the day, what we're interested in is what causes a snowflake to fall, what happens when that snowflake reaches the land surface or gets stuck in trees and limbs of trees before it melts. And so what happens after that snowflake melts? And so it's got a variety of pathways it can take. Um, less frequently can make its way immediately to your local stream or, uh, or river, but more often the fate of that snowflake actually is a downward progression. It melts on the land surface, begins its journey down into the soil environment. What you're looking at here on the right-hand side is a 3D reconstruction, you know, sort of cube with that nice green land surface of lush vegetation, a nice big aspen tree in this case growing on the left hand side. And that dark brown is what you would, you know, typically think of the soil when you're out in your backyard thinking of the soil layer. Well, there's more to sort of the story of water beneath our feet than just that brown soil layer. We may actually move into other compartments, if you will, sort of like a uh, Kind of a, a bank account with different accounts uh, within that um, that that system that we need to take account of the amount of water that fills each of those accounts. And so we install infrastructure and equipment that allows us to measure how that the water from that melting snowflake makes its way down through the soil and the underlying bedrock. And so there's a really important relationship between overlying soil and underlying bedrock specifically what we call the weathering zone. And so our work is really designed to understand what happens when that snowflake melts and moves downward through the soil, the weathering zone, and ultimately the bedrock. Well, what happens at that point? The, the groundwater associated with this below ground processes has a variety of trajectories. A large fraction of it ultimately wakes, makes its way back down uh, to feed streams and river flows, but a very, very significant portion of it is actually utilized by vegetation, such as that nice green layer of grass, but really importantly, these trees. And so we actually spend a lot of time instrumenting and making measurements of when and where trees are using, utilizing that below ground resource of water. And so we've established a network of monitoring sites throughout this very representative watershed that allow us to track the fate of the meltwater from that snowflake as it moves downward, and then in many cases moves back upward when trees start using that water. As trees use that water, 
that water now moves back up, is respired by trees as a part of photosynthesis, and has been is again turned back into water vapor for the atmosphere. And so trying to understand how different parts of the landscape, areas covered by grasses and aspen trees, such as you see here, compare to other areas of the watershed that are dominated by evergreens. So conifers, pines, spruce, um, uh, fir trees allow us to understand differences across the landscape, particularly in terms of the predominant vegetation type, grasses, aspen trees, conifers, utilize water and either allow or prevent that melting snowflake to ultimately find their way back down to feed stream flow to the bigger Colorado River system that Jeremy presented earlier. And so different trees, and we're looking at trees right now in respect to conifers, exert different influences on how that snowflake makes its way to the land surface. We're all familiar with the concept of an evergreen. They're evergreen because they never lose their needles for the most part. And so a lack of losing needles actually serves as a great interceptor for snowflakes falling down through the winter and spring that keeps those snowflakes from reaching the land surface, melting and driving that flow of water through the soil, weathering zone and bedrock. In contrast, yeah, well. areas of grasses and aspen trees exert a very different control in their ability to get snowflakes to the land surface. And so having instrumentation across the diversity of landscape types in terms of conifer, conifer deciduous forests and grasses is really critical for understanding the fate of water tied to that snowflake. Cool. So you basically have these, these weather stations tied to deep wells that are monitoring what water is doing underground, tied to plant, you know, tree sensors that are actually monitoring how that water is moving up into vegetation. And all together that creates, I believe what you call it, bedrock to canopy view of how water is is acting and how specifically how it's acting in each of these kind of unique biomes you've identified, whether that's deciduous forests like aspens, whether it's conifers like pine trees, or you know, mountain meadows or alpine, which is you know above the trees altogether. So tell me a little more about what the importance of groundwater is in all of this. I feel like that's kind of the invisible you know, an invisible factor. It's not something most people think about that much. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's um, it's literally the water beneath our feet. And it's actually a really, really important component of flow in rivers that we're familiar with. Walking around in our backyards, walking around in the Colorado River Basin, you see stream flow. And it, of course, varies over the course of the year. You know, during the period after snowpack begins to melt, we see really big increases in stream flow. As that snowpack melts out and we move into the summer and fall season, you still see flow in streams. Mm -hmm. The vast bulk of the flow in those streams is actually supported by groundwater. And so oh, if you don't have an understanding of how groundwater both accumulates tied to recharge from snowmelt and then discharges to stream flow, you're missing more than 50% of the water story in these mountainous systems. And so having measurements that allow us to track variations in groundwater from year to year, season to season, is critically important to understanding how these streams will respond to climate change in the future. That's cool. Interesting. So okay, cool. That's that's such a it's such an un seen part of it all, but it makes sense that that is ultimately a really big part of the picture here. So to get a picture of the entire watershed, you obviously have this really this scattered network of sensor systems. Um, what, I mean, it, it, there, there's obviously, as you, you know, mentioned with your, your battered land cruiser, there's a lot of challenge inherent to constantly going out, traversing these mountain landscapes and accessing all of these independent sensor stations to, you know, get them with a thunder and download that data. What is the uh, kind of the, the, what would, what would make that process better? Well, access is a huge issue. While the snowpack is the you know, central story in terms of how much water leaves a watershed, it presents really big you know, um, sort of roadblocks for our ability to rapidly download the data from this big diversity of sites. Here's my site in a conifer forest. Here's my site in a grassland. Here's my site in an aspen forest. Snow and wintertime conditions make it really hard to get access to that data. And so what we really are interested in coming up with approaches that allow us 
to have insight in what's happening at a given location at a given point in time in real time. In the same way I can pick up my phone right now and say, wow, I just got an email message. I would love to have an observational network that alerts me to say, wow, something unique and interesting has just happened at your site so that I can then respond in a very rapid and you know, efficient fashion. Very cool. Okay, well, that brings us to what we, what uh, Andrew and uh, folks with ESNet are doing to kind of solve this problem of access. So I'll pass it off to Andrew. Yeah, absolutely. And it really, our, our role in this process is to try and build Ken that near real time network that that he and other scientists need. And, and that's enormously challenging in this kind of area because, you know, there, you're dealing with a space where communications may be very limited. There may not be cell service. There may not be any kind of uh, real good radio coverage at all. Um, and so what you have to do is figure out how you're going to connect these network of sensors that may be scattered out through the landscape, and some may be underground, some may be attached to trees, some may be a distance from, from each other, and try and uh, create a capability for those to then, in near real time, communicate and move their data uh, back to the database or the model or wherever, whatever, uh, whatever use is being made of that information. Um, so uh, we've been approaching this problem sort of a couple of different ways, and this is very much sort of uh, developing technology. Um, with a couple of different pieces. Um, uh, and again, it, the, there's no what, right one answer to it because different sensors have different capabilities. They have different availability of power. They have different data rates, uh, different kinds of information that have to pass back and forth. So what we've been working to do is, is um, deploy something we're calling a sensor distribution station, which is um, a solar powered a unit that supports a variety of different sort of local wireless standards. So Wi-Fi, like you might have in your home, um, LoRa, which is another standard, stands for long range communications. It's a mesh network capability. Um, but there's other, other types of standards we'll be deploying based on what each sensor can use and how it can communicate based on what its constraints are and line of sight and stuff like that. So you have this local sensor station and then that local sensor uh, distribution station uh, is connected via a private 4G or 5G network, um, uh, basically like a private cellular service um, that we're deploying in the area to be able to sort of paint a wider area of the landscape. Um, and this is something that's very new for us at ESNet. We haven't operated sort of wireless equipment in this way before, um, but that lets us basically operate um, uh, very much like you know you do with your your handset at home, except we're communicating with with a fixed solar powered station. Um, then the next part of the problem is well we don't have fiber optic. Um, at the at the location where the cellular network is operated from. So you know you think about your local cell tower. When your when your phone communicates with that cell tower, it's actually going onto then a fiber optic network that's connected to that cell tower. Now the problem we have in this place is there is no fiber optic, so there's no high speed connection to get data back from the top of the mountain where it connects to the cell tower back to the lab. So in order to do that, we've we've had to make use of a new capability called Starlink, which is a low Earth orbit satellite constellation. Uh, you may have heard about that. It's um, uh, uh, coming online now, and many people are using it in all kinds of different settings, but it's, it's very exciting technology. Um, and so we're using this low Earth orbit satellite constellation to then backhaul, as we call it, moving data back, um, the data from the cellular network that we have operating in this, in this remote area um, back to... Um, our fiber optic network, and it connects in Seattle, and then move that data from Seattle uh, to Lawrence Berkeley National Lab or wherever it needs to go. So that's the you... basic architecture there. So there's a couple of different pieces that all have to come together to work to make this backhaul and two-way real-time comms happen. That's awesome. Can you walk us through how this actually looks out in the field? Sure, absolutely. So uh, so right now we're, we're at a, a, a meadow called Snodgrass, um, and uh, uh, there's actually... If you look in the in the foreground right here underneath the trees, you see a couple of different sensor stations, and those are collecting a variety of different of environmental and hydrological and other kinds of data that scientists need. Um, off in the distance, uh, right here, actually, you'll see actually right behind me, you just changed you. That's great. Um, this is the solar powered uh, data uh, uh, collection station. So this is operating in that area and it's providing Wi-Fi and LoRa and other services to sensors that are in the immediate area, sort of within line of sight. So okay, that's basically the router. That's the router. That's the first step in the in the data journey. And then uh, if you go back real quick, Jeremy, oh, sure. uh, can you back two photos real quick? Yeah. 
Uh, perfect. So uh, what you can see in this thing off in the distance here, I don't know, you can't see my pointer, but up there's a little white spot. There you go, right there. That's right actually there. where our cell tower is located. So uh, the you sensor station the label there, right, there. right there is actually connected on our private cellular network. And it's sending the data to this, which is the uh, that the other side of that white dot on that on that hill, and this is uh, an atmospheric radar monitoring station run by uh, a, a, a different program, but it's a meteorological radar station. Uh, and then on the other side of this round dish, which is the radar, um, actually go back if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, right on the other side, you can't see it's hidden behind the radar here. There's actually a cellular antenna that's on the other side of that of that catwalk there underneath the radar dish, which is the round dome. Um, anyway, that's collecting the data from that 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 uh, that area called Snodgrass that I spoke of, and that data is coming down and coming into the trailer. And then right in the foreground, right here, is the Starlink antenna, um, and that Starlink antenna is passing the data to a satellite uh, in orbit um, that is then sending the data to Seattle, uh, where it enters our fiber optic network. And you can see behind me. Um, on this side, I can never, I can never do the pointing. So that's that's Seattle up there, and that's where where, where things come come to ground. Oh, there you go, okay, perfect. <laughs> so um, there's kind of a complicated path for like all those hops to happen for data from that sensor to go from the sensor to the wireless collection station on Snodgrass to the cell tower to the Starlink to Seattle, and then into ESnet's fiber optic network where it comes to Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, which is the yellow dot on the on the the left side of that that map right there. Wow. So um, that's the that's the path and how it works. And we're very excited to sort of make these things all work together and get these technologies, uh, many of which are very new, uh, working together. That's amazing. So after after all of these steps of you know you you basically attach a a you go out to all these sensor stations scattered throughout the field and you create a, kind of a central router for each of them you know nearby so they can all be wirelessly connected to that that router then beams uh, all of that information to like a central radio head with a satellite upload goes up to space satellite fleet sends it to Seattle and Seattle's finally where you have this actual plug into the fiber optic network that is kind of the super highway of ESnet and at that point finally any scientist anywhere in the world can can be like plugging right into this exactly exactly and that's 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 the vision that's what we're working towards and the idea here is that we want to be able to provide can and other scientists with near real time data but we also want to have them have the ability to say control their sensor systems without having to drive that into the field um, and uh, uh, particularly when it's you know when there's snow on the ground, that can be particularly tricky. Oh, cool. So it's not it's not just like a one way. You're not just reading. You can also kind of send back instructions of like you know collect collect information or change the rate of data sampling. Or exactly. That's what, that's what we're working towards. Really cool. And then you know sometime in the future, it may be possible to fly a UAV, for example, and just like the one you flew, Jeremy, to to make some of these photos. Mm -hmm. And and actually that that we can use that to move sensors around, for example, in the hills without having to have, have people uh, uh, do it by hand. That's awesome. So why can you can you tell me a little more about like what is I guess first of all like what do national labs exist to do and you know, as uh, how does this work fit within that kind of broader goal? Yeah, no. So, so U.S. National Lab System is 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 really a wonderful. It's 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 one of the big backbones behind sort of how our nation has become prosperous and and many of the big scientific challenges that we've had to face. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, the National Labs exists to basically help the country manage. Uh, hard problems. So hard problems like the climate's changing, hard problems like we need new sources of energy, um, uh, you know, hard problems like uh, like defense problems that we have. So, so you know, we, we cover all kinds of different uh, activities and particularly at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, everything we do relates to sort of basic science. You know, we're really, it's a, the lab is set up to help teams of scientists understand the fundamental properties of the universe and our planet and to help then understand like where we're going and how we can how we can end up in a better place than than we might if we weren't managing the problem. Mm, really cool. And I'll I'll take a moment to pause and just say anyone in the audience, you're more than welcome to submit questions about anything that is unclear, anything you're wondering or you know want to hear from uh, Ken or Andrew. Um, uh, in the meantime, uh, I'll actually Ken I'll bring you back. Uh, I'm curious to hear you know within this this national lab system. Uh, how how does field work work? Like, who do you collaborate with? Uh, what you know? What are the parties that kind of go into the work that you do out there? 
Yeah, thanks so much. So, I mean, one of the big aspects of doing national lab science is, science is what we call team-based science. And so to really understand how a watershed works and its ability to deliver water now and in the future requires a team of scientists, really a, a team of teams. You need people that are specialists in vegetation, right? How are these plants utilizing water? You need experts in hydrologic modeling, right? How do numeric models describe how water flows? You need atmospheric scientists that, scientists that really understand how, when, and where snow is, and precipitation uh, are, are falling. And so what we do is we really serve as what I call a community watershed to actually host the activities of not just national lab scientists, but other scientists with ex expertise that we need. Folks from the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, folks that are specialists in atmospheric measurements, folks, folks that might be specialists in microbiology that you would think, well, why is that important? Well, microbiota really control the, uh, the behavior of vegetation to a, to a large degree. And so to get to Jeremy's question, it really, when we create a research experimental watershed, such as what we have in central Colorado, it necessitates a team of teams those come from both the national lab system as well as our partners at the university and other federal agencies. Very cool. What, uh, Andrew, or you know, you really either of you, uh, could you tell me a little more? I think you you mentioned that this is really the first time ESnet is branching into this this realm of like, you know, how can we connect kind of small scattered things in the field to this big set of infrastructure? What? What do you imagine is kind of the future of this? Like, what are some of the other applications you can see? Yeah, absolutely. And actually, that kind of relates also to one of the questions that just came up in the chat. Someone asked, like, how difficult would this be to do in, a, in another area? And, mm -hmm. and the answer is, you know, this is very much, you know, we're in the process of learning. Uh, so we're in the process of deploying and, and understanding how we want to uh, uh, build this. There's really a long-term capability that's that's connected to ESnet and, and, the, and the, the science that we support. Um, so... You know, in terms of in terms of you know the deployment, um, uh, uh, you know, really that depends on the specifics of the geography, the terrain, the vegetation, the number of sensors, mm -hmm. how things are working there. It's hard to answer that directly. Mm -hmm. Certainly, it's very easy to set up Starlink. Uh, it works sort of anywhere in the continental U.S. and and, and abroad. Um, but the terminals themselves are fairly expensive and fairly uh, power hungry, which is why you don't use them to directly support the sensors in the field. Um, so then you need to figure out, okay, so how do you want to manage um, the coverage in the local area? And actually, in many ways, the trickiest part of this whole problem is the last 500 feet, mm -hmm. um, more so than the, 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 the other 1,500 miles. Mm -hmm. um, because it's really, the, you know, every sensor is different. Every sensor has its own data collector. They have their own protocols. They're built there for their own purposes. Uh, very often, they're very constrained in terms of power that they have available or what they're able to do. And mm. so really one of the big lessons that we're learning is, is not so much that hard problem of the first 1500 miles, it's that last 500 feet. And how do we deploy technologies that are suitable to operate you know, unattended in rugged re remote rural areas um, with very little power use um, and very little attention. And that's really the hard part. But I think, I think we are trying to work our way towards something we're calling like a wireless data transfer node, which is a, a standard for how this might work. Cool. Um, and oh. I think as that comes together, then we would be looking to expand, you know, how we can offer this to other people. But at, at ESnet, we're sort of entirely driven by scientific need. We we exist as a support function for for scientists who have to deploy things. Awesome. That is, yeah, that's so cool. And it just seems like a, you know, the the kind of dawn of a new a new era of like what's possible in terms of this this field work that has typically been so constrained by you know the existence of existing infrastructure. Um, another question that just rolled through in the chat is about the like implications of this for management. And I think that it will actually be best answered if we uh, go back to Ken to talk about why it matters. Like what, you know, what are the actual implications of this beyond just convenience uh, and, you know, the ability to, to get out to these field sensors more often? Yeah, great. I was busy typing a reply to that uh, that Q and A in real time, so <laughs> you caught me a little off guard. And so, absolutely. So, traditionally, the approach has been, and you're probably familiar with this, is we have a network of U.S. Geological Survey funded stream discharge monitoring locations, 
And so we can look in on the course of a day or a week or the past month or year, or in some cases, hundreds of years, what are the stream flow behaviors over the course of the year? How much water is coming out of the system? Because at the end of the day, that's what really matters for downstream users. Jeremy touched on when we introduced the uh, the web-based story map, you know, the importance of this color of water to locations as far downstream as the Imperial Valley for growing much of our wintertime agricultural crops for uh, for lettuces and you know for other vegetables. And so understanding over the course of the year how much water is actually going to make its way downstream for users to use is critical. And so the USGS has been great in installing discharge monitoring stations. So how much water is flowing past a given point on this river at any point in time? That's great. What we've tried to describe and what we're really interested in is all of the if you will, upstream activities from plants, from the sun, from other factors that impact how much water makes its way into the system, we need to also make those measurements as well. Because it's not just stream flow that's critical. It's understanding how the entire system behaves in an interconnected fashion. And so the measurements mm -hmm. that we're making are important both in terms of immediate actionable intelligence how much water is flowing, how low or how high are groundwaters, but really it's the data that we need to feed into these predictive models that say, aha, we got this much snowpack this year, here's how much you, Imperial Valley farmer, can expect to have this year. And so it's this mm -hmm. compilation and assimilation of very, very different data types, not just stream discharge, that are critical for the long-term decision-making to understand just how much water we all have to make do with going into the future. Really cool. And I mean, how, how does this new kind of era of like having connected network together sensor systems and therefore like a real time constantly updating data stream, how does that change the paradigm of this, you know, this mandate to be able to, to predict and help manage downstream flows? Where, when, and how things happen. And so mm -hmm. if you don't have an understanding of where the most important parts of a given watershed, um, you know, if you don't understand where the most important parts of the watershed are in terms of regulating the ultimate discharge to streams and you know eventual delivery say down to our imperial valley farmers then you're missing a really important part of the story and so again going back to just measuring stream discharge that's great but if there are certain parts of a watershed or certain parts of the landscape that are that have an outsized importance in terms of providing that stream flow if you don't have the active measurements to understand how they're behaving, you're missing a critical and central part of the story. And so what we're trying to do is, again, deploy measurements and monitoring across all the different components of the landscape with this critical sort of additive component that allows us to make these measurements and understand how they're changing in real time. How do they vary in April? How do they vary in May? How do they vary in September? That's the big sort of nut we're trying to crack because that's at the heart of understanding which parts of our watershed are most vulnerable to climate change and how those ultimately impact the delivery of water, not just to our local communities, to those far downstream. Really cool. Andrew, this might be more of a question for you, but you know, I imagine the more, the more senses you have and also the more kind of variables that are monitoring it seems like you you very quickly start to have this kind of torrent of data, this you know massive body of information. How does you know really the net this this kind of growing you know age of having a huge amount of information and increasing like computers that can process it? How does that plug into to all of this question of just like infrastructure? Yeah, no, and no, that's a that's a great question, and it really is the primary motivator for you know a lot of what we're doing here. Um, you know. You know, just on, just on the uh, sort of optical traffic side, our, our traffic grow, grows by a factor of, of uh, um, is growing about sixty percent a year. So, uh, so it's you know sort of exponential growth, and that's also happening in the field science community. Um, 
what's also happening is, is you, you imagine, start to imagine a world where sensors are deployed sort of much more widely, collecting much more data. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you're also going to start to see changes in how sensors are used. And that's the getting at the sort of Ken's point about, you know, uh, the improved ability to manage things. Not only can you measure things in real time, but you can also begin to respond to them um, in, in much faster than you ever could before. Um, so, you know, in terms of in terms of what that means for the network, it means, you know, we're we're running as fast as we can just to keep up, right? Our our job, ESNet's job, is to free scientists from geographic constraints and make it possible for folks to to really focus on their science and what they need to do. Um, and so it, it, this makes it sort of essential for us to, to, to explore this wireless space, to understand the kinds of capabilities that are coming online, and then to figure out what, what the service model is going to be for us, for scientists, in terms of deploying these sets of capabilities or leveraging uh, commercial systems like Starlink, um, where we can to, to help make the job easier. Cool. Ken? Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing. You know, even 10 years ago, I had no predictive power over what type of sensors were now suddenly going to be available to make measurements that might be of interest. And so while we haven't highlighted here, one of the other histories that this particular watershed is a long legacy of mining and metal impacted waterways. And so can we come up and do we have access to sensors that have the ability to potentially measure sudden changes, for instance, in heavy metal contamination of our waterways. If that's the case, that's really important information to get out in front of in real time. Why would you be interested in saying, yes, our sensor measured a sudden discharge of some you know, really deleterious metal to, uh, to a river uh, environment, and discovered that only two months later. Why not have mm. the ability and work towards solutions that allow us to say, my goodness, we've just discovered a really important environmental event. I'm giving you an example mm. of a metal release. For instance, we saw this in Southern Colorado tied to the, uh, to the Gold King mine spill. It's really important mm. to think about sensor technologies that don't even exist yet, which may that provide immediate information about how the environment is responding that allow us then as scientists and eventually, you know, water users, downstream users and water regulators to act upon that information in real time. That's something we Mm. haven't had really access to in a meaningful way across these really remote locations until the advent of this project. That's super interesting. It strikes me too that that, is related to like a climate change future where you know you're having increasingly intense sudden unprecedented events like i don't know say you're a really really unseasonably warm day in march you might have this massive influx of meltwater that you know suddenly downstream people need to react to but they can't do that if their first you know their first inkling of it is that their river swells massively that's a great example. If you're if you're at the point of looking out your back window and seeing the rising floodwaters, that's too late. If you have the ability to actually tie into a real time network of information that allows alerts to be fed, for instance, to use Jeremy's example, let's say we're in late March and it's a very warm day and we get a very heavy precipitation event, but it's not snow, it's rain. That snow drives very, very, very rapid melt in a way that sends a lot of water to streams that has the potential from a flooding perspective to impact downstream communities. And so the ability to actually ingest or take in as much information as we can, even in locations that are so remote that have no access to any other form of telecommunications, that's where the added value comes, I think, in terms of the relationship of our science to the broader public. That's really cool. Well, I think that's as good a segue as any to talk about what, you know, the future of at least river science in, you know, the Rocky Mountains might look like and what some of the other areas you're looking to branch out into are. Yeah, I'll jump in on uh, that. And do you want to talk a little bit about Union Park? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as we begin to think about you know, parts of our, you know, global network of watersheds that are being heavily impacted by climate change, we can actually look for what we call some sentinel sites. So sites that, you know, locations in a watershed or in a mountainous environment that are very likely to be impacted by 
climate disturbance. Maybe that's massive wildfire. We've seen a ton of that in California, obviously. We've seen a ton of that several years ago in Colorado, but there are other drivers that are impacting our forests, right? As temperatures rise, you see increased impacts of uh, mortality for trees driven by insects. And so can we begin to think about a future world where we're out in front of managing our forests to try and minimize these giant deleterious impacts? Can we actually proactively manage our forests in a way that improves their resistance and resilience to things like wildfire and insect mortality? If we can, can we begin to look at the consequences of actively managing our forests on water resources? I think we can, but the ability to actually relate those measurements, right, or those activities, managing a forest, selectively logging to improve forest health, running prescribed burns to link then to that activity to water export, how much water leaves the system, that's going to require active measurements. That's going to require this expanding network of existing and to come future sensors that yeah. understand the relationship. That's where we want to be. Those activities are occurring in places where we have no chance anytime in the near future mm. to tie into existing cellular networks. And so the work that we described here today, we think is the next step in bringing measurement to active land management to improve forest health and water resources. That's where we're going. And that's where I think this work really represents a foundational first step. That's so cool. Amazing. Well, that is uh, an awesome overview of just kind of what this work is and what it might mean for, you know, really uh, everyone who depends on the Colorado River and, and the future of understanding these mountain watershed systems. I want to take a moment to just like acknowledge what I think has already been touched on a couple of times explicitly. Uh, which is just that like this this type of collaboration between, say, like a geoscientist who works private, predominantly in the field and a network engineer who works, you know, abstractly on this like, you know, a, a worldwide system of infrastructure is is not a no brainer. It's it's not a given, especially, you know, in academia or, you know, private industry as it exists. So uh, I think that's a really cool thing about the national lab system. And specifically, Berkeley Lab has this really cool legacy of team science and the idea that you can get multidisciplinary groups of people working together all under the same roof. Um, so, uh, you know, just a kind of a shout out to Berkeley Lab. And I want to bring in Faith, uh, the director of the K-12 programs, to talk a little more about how people can get involved with working at Berkeley Lab uh, and how that kind of starts from a really young age. Sure. Thanks, Jeremy. And thanks, Ken and Andrew, for your great overview of the work and research and making it accessible um, to everybody tonight. Um, for Berkeley Lab, we are very um, enthusiastic about developing the future of STEM and especially giving students an opportunity to see themselves in STEM workforces, STEM workplaces. So our K-12 team actually has a high school internship program as well as some camps. Um, starting with, we're opening up our um, application for our bilingual STEM camp in April. Um, on December 5th, we'll be opening up our SAGE STEM camp for um, young women and those that are non-binary in uh, January and our internship and uh, pre-training internship program in February. So we're going to be busy over the next couple of months um, recruiting students and making sure that they get the opportunity to see themselves for as little as three days, five days, and a whole six weeks here at the laboratory. And we know that those students can go on to the DOE-funded um, undergraduate graduate, and community college programs that are supported and um, hosted by our Workforce Development and Education Office here that Alisa is putting a link to in the chat box. So we're both working together to make sure that students get an opportunity at a very early age. And we are so grateful for all the scientists, researchers, and staff here at Berkeley Lab who support all of the students um, through their volunteer efforts and service um, across the laboratory with the 4,000 employees and 1,700 scientists and researchers. So um, that's a way that people can get interested, get started, um, and start off their career at one of the DOE national laboratories. So thanks for allowing us to talk about that and 
Um, I'll pass it back to you, Jeremy. Yeah, and I, for one, can speak firsthand to the, uh, you know, the value and the power of uh, these internship programs, because I myself came to the lab as a undergraduate intern, so actually working with Ken Williams, of all people. So it's a, it's a really cool uh, resource that exists, and we hope that, you know, this, this story map and, and kind of uh, communication tools that help encapsulate some of the work that's being done at Berkeley Lab can you know be a tool for folks uh, in that you know that goal of educating about what kind of research is being done at institutions like this and how it impacts people like the 40 million folks uh, ourselves included who depend on the Colorado. Um, with that there uh, we're just about out of time there's actually one more question in the chat that I thought was really interesting we didn't get to uh, can 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 these sensors be used to measure soil dryness and how does that have an effect on water, wildfire I'm sorry wildfire burn uh, and soil sterilization? Yeah, it was a great question. Um, and so yeah, that's one of the sensor technologies that we have you know sort of well and firmly developed over the past you know 15, 20, 30 years. That's the ability to monitor. Uh, variations in moisture content of soils. And so as soils get dry, vegetation becomes stressed. Vegetation, when stressed, moves toward a model of let's shut everything down. When vegetation moves to the let's shut everything down model, it becomes much more susceptible to heavy burn and severe burn. And so very wet vegetation, any of us that are campers or you know, even of our, uh, our, 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 our fireplaces at home, Trying to light a you know a wet stump on fire or wet twigs on stop, fire is really hard. Trying to light dry, brittle, um, you know, uh, woody biomass on fire is really easy. And so the ability to monitor variations in soil moisture content or dryness at multiple locations, not just one or two. Like everything we're talking about today is designed to expand our network of monitoring locations at scales that matter, to capture all that variability in a very complicated watershed, you know, that's where we're trying to go. And so the, you know, with respect to soil moisture and soil dryness, capturing where and when soils are abnormally dry allows us to think about fire potential in a way that's very different than not having that information. And so worrying about parts of the watershed that might be on fire or soon to be on fire tied to a fire event that are already pretty wet, maybe that allows you to marshal your resources in firefighting to areas where your sensor network says, my goodness, these soils pre-fire are extremely dry, mm -hmm. extremely arid, and more likely to lead to catastrophic wildfire. Great question. Cool. Awesome. Well, uh, with that, I we're at the end of our hour and I'll let everyone go and I'll just highlight the final aspect of the story map, which is uh, these resources at the end here uh, designed to kind of be educational resources for folks, uh, as well as links to all of the websites of the organizations mentioned here, like ESNet, like ESA and Berkeley Lab. Um, so thank you all so much for attending and thank you, Andrew and Ken, for being here and being involved in this work. Uh, it's been awesome to learn about it. Well, thank you, Jeremy. This is awesome. Really fun to do. And, and thanks for the great story, Matt. It's really, really cool to see. Course, yeah, I would say this is, you know, okay. I'll, I'll, let, let me just thank Jeremy as well. I, um, I've worked with Jeremy for a long time. Uh, we'll continue to be working with Jeremy, hopefully, for a long time. These story maps are the future. These story maps are absolutely the essential linchpin between communicating what's often very complicated and impenetrable science and engineering to the audience that matters, the individuals that actually rely on these, in this case, water resources. And so I thank you, Jeremy, for really spending the time to try and present complicated ideas, complicated measurements in a fashion that we can all understand. Thanks again. Of course, it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure. And Elisa, just put the link to the story map in the chat. We'll we'll definitely be sharing it out, uh, you know, through our channels uh, in the coming weeks. But I hope that you all can take the time to go check it out or share it with anyone who might be interested. All right, and with that, uh, I think we'll call it a night. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you all. Thanks all.